Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Sandra Kehoe with x -Rite Photo and Video, and I wanted to do a brief introduction to our presenter today, Kevin Ames. Kevin is a professional commercial photographer based in Atlanta. He's also one of the original members of the x -Rite Colorati community. He's authored four books on photography and Photoshop and uh, is also uh, an author on PhotoFocus, so he is an expert in everything photography and everything color management. Um, if anyone has any questions during today's presentation, please feel free to type them into the question box on the control panel, and Kevin will be happy to address those questions throughout the presentation. Also, I want to note that at the end of today's presentation, everyone will receive a brief Four question survey, and anyone who completes the survey will be entered into a drawing to win an X Rite i1 Display Pro monitor calibrator and color checker passport. Kevin? Sandra, th thank you so much, Sandra. Welcome, everyone. Um, as Sandra said, I'm a commercial photographer. That's how I make my main living. And I've been living with color checker charts since the days of film. And all of the photographs you see on your screen right now are made digitally, even though the uh, color checker, the original color checker right here with Michael Coles and Christina and in this maternity portrait, those were done with the one that I got when I was using film. And we, back then we used our lab to read the patches and tell us what filter pack to put over the lens to color correct the film emulsion back to neutral. Now it's really easy using Lightroom or Photoshop or really whatever raw processor you're using. I'm going to concentrate on Lightroom and Photoshop for the webinar and uh, show you how to use both camera raw and Lightroom. So what I want to do now is start with, let's see, we'll start right here and talk about color. Because the first thing the color checker does is it allows us to control the color of our image. It allows us to make sure that we have a neutral starting place every single time. And that's really critical if you're a commercial photographer like me and I'm doing photographs for a client who has to reproduce a color accurately on the web so that the product that they're selling is the product the customer gets. So the colors match. It's also important for really everybody. For instance, if you're shooting a friend's wedding, how do you know if the dress is really white, particularly if she's standing out on a, a green lawn, there's a lot of green bouncing into the, uh, into, into the dress, and the color checker can help you uh, neutralize the color. But there's a problem, and the problem is very simply that our brains lie to us. Anything that the brain sees that it knows is white will get automatic white balance. So we've got this constant battle of what's going on that the camera sees versus what we as human beings see. And the color checker really is a way that we can get rid of these lies and have a standard to work with. It's even great for exposure, which I'll get into in just a minute. So if I take, if I hold up an Apple mouse, we all know it's white. And no matter what light we're in, we're going to say, yeah, that's white. Our brain says, yeah, that's white. If I show you one that's under a light bulb, it will look just like the one under daylight because your brain will correct it. But when you put them side by side, and let me just change something here really quickly. I really want this one. Okay, well, I've had a just... I've had a, a failure. So let's correct this and I'll show you what it actually looks like. So it would look like this. It would get really warm. So it would look like the light bulb shot here. If we're out in open shade, it's going to look really blue. So let's go to an open shade version.
and I'll correct that one for us as well. In open shade, the color temperature is going to go way up. So it's going to look, it's going to go way down rather. It's going to look really blue. So this is how, this is how the camera sees it as opposed to how we see all three of them in the various light sources as completely white. The color checker allows us to correct for this and make sure that we're getting really accurate color. So what I want to do now is get into the color checker and uh, show you how it works. So let's take a look. Let's start in Lightroom because I think that's probably where most everybody is. Uh, is that pretty much accurate? I'm wondering. So if you could let uh, Sandra know, that would be great. And there's our control panel. Good. Okay. So in Lightroom, here is a, here's a shot that I did for a local restaurant here in Atlanta. And if you're ever here, I really recommend it to you. They've been in business about 20 years. It's called Java Jive and it's down by uh, Pont City Market, which is a brand new development. So if you're ever here, come check them out. But let's take a look at the photograph. So this is a test shot right here. We're getting the, the composition set up and we're starting to add the different products. But as soon as I get everything to where we like the lighting and everything, this is the key. Now, this is the mini grayscale balance card by Color Checker. The white, gray, and black are colorimetrically neutral. That means that they can only give you true neutral colors. Now, neutral means the red and green and blue are equal. But if I put the cursor over this, and I'm just going to tap the W key so that you can see the uh, white balance, you'll notice that the red, green, and blue aren't equal. And with them not being equal, that means there's a color cast. In this case, it's tending towards orange. So if I come over to the gray scale and click on it, it automatically corrects the color. So I'm going to undo that so you can see it. And then I'll redo it. So you can see that it gets a little bit bluer. So now those numbers, and you can read them right under here, but uh, under the histogram, those numbers are now very close to equal. So the color correction in the color checker chart is a really handy thing. And once I've got it done, I can select all of the images. That's Command A on a Mac or Control A for people that use Windows. And then I can just choose the uh, from the settings menu, settings, copy settings. And it gives me a dialog box here. And really, all I need to do is to do the color. And the color correction is right here under white balance. Then we can do exposure and everything else. So to just do color, we'll check none and click white balance and then click copy and then settings, paste settings, and the correct color will be propagated to every image in the set. Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to go through my actual workflow where I go through lens corrections, sharpening, as well as color correction and exposure correction using the color checker. So it's a very, very powerful tool. So um, good. It's I see that most people are using Lightroom. Um, not going to really go into Capture One, but I would like to dispel a myth. I've heard people that teach Capture One say you can't use the color checker uh, in Capture One. And what they're referring to is the software that comes with the color checker passport. It used to come on a disc. Now it's a download from X-Rite that allows you to make a DNG that you can calibrate your camera with when you're using Adobe Camera Raw. And let's clarify Camera Raw for just a minute. Camera Raw is the raw processing engine that both Lightroom and Bridge and Photoshop use. So if you use Lightroom, the controls are slightly different than they are in the Camera Raw that you would get out of uh, Photoshop, or uh, Photoshop or Bridge. 
but they're exactly the same engine. And I like to, th- I like to think of it as, um, somewhat Lightroom is kind of like someone dressed up for a party. They're in a suit maybe. Whereas the f- Photoshop and bridge versions are more working clothes or casual clothes. There are things you wouldn't really want to do in a suit that you could do very easily in casual clothes, but it's exactly the same engine or the same person. So that's a good way to think about it. So let's see. Yeah. Photoshop users were going to do that as well. Sandra is feeding me some information as we go along. I believe in full disclosure. So that's the beginning of color setting. And I'm going to dwell a lot on the color checker passport. One of the things I wanted you to know though, is any color checker product has these three components that you need for using for white balance. Even the new color checker video, which is ideal for people that are shooting video with their DSLRs or professional cameras. Now they can use the waveform monitors in Premiere or any of the editing software for that matter for doing very accurate color grading. So let's go on in Lightroom. I'll tap the G key to go back to the grid mode and let's pick up a set of images. Now my workflow and I'm going to make the thumbnails just a little bit larger so you can see what's going on. This is a favorite model of mine. Her name is Amy Patterson, and we work together quite a bit. And she's just a lot of fun. So uh, book her and book her often through Presence Models Atlanta. And Amy's quite used to the color checker chart. And what I do is I rough my lighting in, as you can see in the first two or three images. Then I get the light meter out. Well, now, One of the things I've discovered is that not every camera sensor, even if it's the same model, is the same. So like I've got a 1DX, um, the very original one, and I have found that it's about a stop and a third darker than my Sekonic L58 light meter says. I really don't care. That's not a big deal. All I have to do is adjust the uh, Sekonic meter for a compensation for a stop on a third. But when I was discovering it, I found out from the color checker that my meter and my camera were doing different things. And that's a very, very powerful thing to have a tool that you can tell. So I'm going to show you a way to absolutely every single time get a perfect exposure. All of these photographs of Amy that I'm going to show you were all shot under the same exact lighting conditions. The light on her face is exactly the same in every single one of them. We'll show you the products down here in a few minutes. So I only have to color correct once. So all I do, Command A to select all, Control A in Windows, and then highlight the last color checker chart, and that's the one I'm going to color correct to. But before I do that, I want to show you how I discovered the exposure problems. So command or control D to deselect, and I'll start with this one. And I'll tap the D key to go into the develop module. By hovering the cursor over here under the histogram, you can see by the numbers that it's underexposed. Okay, I know what you're thinking, and I'll bet you this is the question that Sandra has to ask. Sandra? I'm here. Actually, the question is from Dane Wilson, who wanted to know, will you be talking about monitor calibration? Not this webinar, Uh, although I highly recommend it. For those of you that are very interested in monitor calibration, uh, the amazing Lindsay Adler did one, uh, a webinar for X-Rite last week, uh, and she covers that topic quite well, and I'm hoping I'll be able to come back and do that as well. Uh, in a future webinar. Okay, so let's talk about exposure and the numbers. Back when we were getting started in digital, which is a really long time ago, Photoshop is coming up uh, on 25 and a half years old now. Its birthday is, I believe it's uh, February 18th. So uh, this, this year it'll be 26 years old. Back in the day, we had no way of monitor calibration because X-Rite hadn't figured out how to do that yet because the monitors were, well, they were old cathode ray tubes. They were the CRTs that we, uh, they were an offshoot of television sets, really. 
And so we had to learn the numbers. And I'd like to take a couple of moments right now and teach you the numbers so you can understand what I'm doing with these charts. So I'm just going to pop over into Photoshop and go to this chart right here. And this is a 21 patch grayscale with black on the far left, white on the far right, and in the middle, we've got middle gray. I don't want to get into a big, huge discussion about middle gray, but ever since about Photoshop 6, the numbers got rejiggered, and the original uh, gray, uh, gray cards, and x right continues this to this day, were 18% reflectance. And where the number came from was Kodak got a bunch of people together in Rochester in the summer between the hours of 10 and 2 in the afternoon and put a whole bunch of different grayscale, just gray patches out on picnic tables and said, pick the one that fits in the middle. And then they averaged them and came up with 18%. Well, to do some numbers just for a minute, if you have an 18% gray patch, which is what our light meters and our cameras read, if you point it at a white wall, it comes out about, it doesn't come out 18, it comes out 12 and a half, which I'll explain in a second. But at 18% and you add one stop of light to it, it would be 36% reflectance. You add two stops, it, they double each time, it would be 72% reflectance. And finally, um, you would double it one more time and you get 144% reflectance, which is ridiculous because you can't go more than 100%. So about Photoshop 6, they rejiggered the numbers and Siconic actually honors this in their light meters. They're now calibrated to read 12.5%. It really doesn't matter. It's not that big a deal. But if you do the numbers, 12.5 times 2 is 25. Add another stop times 2, that's 50. Add another stop times 2. That's 100%. So now the numbers really work. And that all goes off of middle gray. Now, I think we've got a question coming from Sandra before I continue much farther. Okay, Kevin, this is a question from Harold Carter. Harold asks, Kevin, my raw files import into Lightroom slightly overexposed with an orange cast. The color checker, however, looks okay. The raw file looks better if I choose the camera standard profile. When I use the color checker profile, it boosts the color. For example, it saturates more than what's actually present. Have you heard of this before? Okay, I'm wondering, would you, Harold, if you could type this back into Sandra and I'll get back to this. Would you let her know if you're using the uh, DNG calibrator uh, software that comes from x that goes along with the color checker? And we'll uh, circle back to that, okay? So getting back to the numbers, in Photoshop, there are 256 steps. Zero is black, 255 is white. In Lightroom, which is a newer iteration of processing than Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, I think, is like eight years old now, the Adobe engineers decided to use a percentage scale. And I don't really want to go into that, but I'll probably write a blog post on photo focus about why the numbers are this way. But there are some that we want to know. The first one is that 12.5% middle gray, 12.5% reflectance. In Photoshop, it's 127 because black and white aren't grays. There's 254 gray, gray shades. And in Lightroom, it's about 50.2%. So those are the numbers for middle gray. Really not a critical thing to remember. It's just kind of interesting. What's critical is where you have highlights with detail. And I want to, I want to go back to the wedding dress. If you have the brightest part of a wedding dress other than a reflectance of, say, the sun in a pearl, and it goes to 242, you will have detail in all of those highlights on any device that you want to reproduce it, whether it's the old-fashioned CMYK printing press, the internet, whether you're going to print it on a printer, doesn't really matter. As long as you've got 242 as your high end, and then there's an ish there, you can go 242, 248, you're going to have detail in any highlight. Again, that's not counting the reflectance of something like the sun or the light source in a chrome bumper 
that's absolutely going to go to 255 or 100%. In Lightroom, the number is 95.1 to about 95.5. The other side of the spectrum is shadows with detail. In this case, it's 25 or 7%. We don't really want something to be completely black. If a woman is wearing a black dress, we still want to see detail in the dress. We want to see the stitching. We want to see the folds. Uh, we want to see the shape. And if we go below 25, it's just going to be a black block with no detail. So 25 is the lowest you want to go. And yeah, there are printers that will reproduce detail below 25, but the printing press won't. So you're always safe if the shadows with detail are at 25 or 7% in Lightroom. The big advantage to all of this is you know that you've always got all of the information you need to make whatever kind of output or print that you want to make. Whether, again, it's on the web, you're going to do a, a Duratrans, a car wrap, it doesn't really matter what the output is. These are safe numbers. And I'm going to show you how we can use the color checker chart to make sure. One last note is that in Photoshop, we can, or in Lightroom for that matter, we can always goose up the blacks to make them darker. But if we block them up to the point in the exposure where there's no detail there, there's no way to get it back. So it's okay to have not have a lot of detail no, let me rephrase that. It's okay to have a lot of detail in the blacks in your raw capture because you can always darken them. But if they're not there, you can't get them back. Same thing goes with the highlights. If you uh, are exposing and you've got 255 on that exposure, those highlights will never come back. That's pure white. So let's see. Um, do we have another question, Sandra, at this point? No, but I do have a response from Harold who Great. said, pretty new to Lightroom, so he can't recall how he did it, going directions. Tell you what, would if you have a way, I'm going to put my uh, website up at the end of this, Harold, and uh, there's contact information on there if you'd like to give me a call, because we're going to have a lot, I've got a lot of questions to ask you, and I'll be glad to help you solve the uh, issue, but I think it's something we want to take offline. I don't think it's going to really fit where we're going in the webinar because it's a very, very specific issue. And I'm sure that we can come up with a solution for you. Thank you for your question. And I look forward to hearing from you offline. So we've got the numbers. Let's go back to Lightroom and see how they relate. So 95.1 is a proper exposure. Well, you can see from the numbers up here under the histogram, I'll put the cursor back on the white patch, that 81, 81.1, and 80.7 are nowhere close. So here's an increased exposure, 92.3, 92.4, 92.4, pretty neutral, but not a really good exposure. So I've, I add more light, and sure enough, here we are. This is, uh, this is right where we want to be. Now, interestingly, notice in the basic panel that's open that the color temperature is as shot. So my camera was balanced almost perfectly for it. You can tell by the numbers. The first step, though, in spite of that, is I'm going to tap the W key or click on the eyedropper and bring it off on and go from the white down to the fourth patch. And you'll see the numbers there. It's almost perfectly neutral, but you've got 82 red, 82 green, and 83.8 blue. So this has a tiny blue cast. Not much, but enough to cause problems later. Did you see how Amy warmed up? Let's undo that, Commander Control Z. Now watch. Whoops, let's not zoom in. Let's get the so there you see that we've got a much warmer image. Now, while we're here, I want to talk about some of the other things that the color checker can do, and then we'll get back to exposure. But let's finish up with color. These patches right here give us a way of either warming everything consistently or cooling everything consistently. So if I choose several images, and I'm just going to choose these three right here, and come over in Lightroom and click this little button, 
to auto sync. That means that everything that's selected will be treated exactly the same way. And if I click on the blue patch right here with the white balance tool, and that is a W on either Windows or the Mac, and click, do you see how much warmer it gets? Now, since we're going to be using this quite a bit right now, I'm going to uncheck the auto dismiss button so it will stay up. And as I come down this list, you'll see the image gets consistently cooler. On this side, there are versions for fluorescent light. So you can control the warmth and the coolness under fluorescent light because it has a magenta component. And you can always go back to neutral by clicking the neutral patch. So there you have how the color checker sees color and how it becomes a tool creatively to set the warmth that you want for your image to relate to the people that are viewing it. So you can pick the colors that you want just by simply selecting the images, checking auto sync, and clicking on one of the patches. Now, if you're doing science fiction, you might want to check out some of these colors, although this was what the color checker chart was never, ever intended for. Uh, it's sometime interesting to play with. Okay, now I'm going to reset these, and you'll notice that down here it just takes a minute, but they will actually auto-sync and ran correct. So I want to reset those because we want to do everything together at once because I've got a whole workflow that I'm going to share starting with color. So I'm going to select all of the images, Command A, that would be Control A in Windows. The first thing is to click the fourth patch to set the color. And I'm going to bring back the auto dismiss because I'm finished with the tool. I'll put it away by clicking here. Now, if I hover over the white patch, you'll see that we're at 95.5 red, 95.4 green, 95.0 blue. That is a great exposure. The next thing is I want to adjust the uh, highlights or the whites. I'm going to set the white clipping. Now, it's a little difficult in Lightroom, and I'll show you how easy it is in Camera Raw later. But what I have to do is if I click, not click, if I tap the greater than or the less than keys, I can move through the controls on the panel. So I can hover the cursor over something. So if I needed to change the exposure, I can go to Exposure, right there, and then I can increase it with the plus key, I can decrease it with the minus key, and if I want to go in the smallest increment, add the option or the alt key, and you can do it in hundredths of a stop. So you've got complete control right from the keyboard. And this is how Lightroom works around not having uh, color samplers, which I'll demonstrate later. So in the whites, this is white clipping. What I want to do is hold down the Option or the Alt key. The screen goes black. And as I drag the cursor to the right, you'll see colors show up. Well, the red color indicates, and I'm going to give, give you a bunch of colors here. Red indicates that red is now at 100%. Yellow indicates, there's yellow, that red and green are at 100%. Uh, blue would be 100%, cyan would be red and blue. You get the idea. But once I see that color checker patch pop up, so I don't care if the skin tones go all the way up because sometimes a highlight in skin will read 100% red. It doesn't mean that there's not detail because there's still the green channel and the blue. But I'm going to back that off a little bit and then put the cursor over it and it's going to read in the high 99s. That's perfect because we've already set the exposure for the proper amount of light. This gives us the brightest possible point for what would be known as specular highlights. The next one to do is the blacks. Again, holding down the option key, everything goes white. I'm going to look down here, and sure enough, if you look, this is well, just barely under the 7%. I'm going to leave that alone because I don't want it to get any darker. So there is the color and the exposure tweaks. 
Once those are done, it's flavoring everything else to taste. In detail for sharpening, and I'll just tap the E key. I'm sorry, I want to be in the develop module. For sharpening, I'm going to go to about 100%. I find that is just perfect for most everything you're going to do. The next one is lens corrections. And all of the lenses that we currently have available, at least pretty much all of them, there are hundreds of them in uh, Camera Raw, have profile corrections available. These correct things like uh, distortion, vignetting. So I'm going to click Enable Profile Corrections. If I want to see the profile, yeah, sure enough, the Sigma 24 to 105 f4, and they're using Adobe's profile for it. And notice that this little slider right here controls the vignetting, and you can see that it gets it gets rid of any vignetting that's in the lens. The next thing that we want to look at is the color, and that's chromatic aberration. And all lenses have it, and it's a super easy fix. Just click that checkbox, and that takes care of any of the light channels that fall on the sensor slightly out of focus that would give you a color fringe. Usually you'll see it in the highlights and you'll see a highlight, and then on the edge of it against a darker background, you'll see maybe a red or a cyan color. So let's see. Do you have uh, – so no more questions for the moment. Sandra, is that right? Uh, no, actually, I do have oh, a question. Um, Kevin, can you set exposure if you only have the larger color checker target? So I'm guessing they're referring to the classic color checker. Yeah, yes, we can. As a matter of fact, let me show you. I can just pop into Photoshop here and go back to that original picture. If you look at the original color checker chart, there's the white, there's the gray, and there's the black. That's all you need. You can't do the fancy color manipulations using these two columns that I showed you, but you can certainly do the color checking and that the uh, exposure checking with those with those patches right there. So absolutely, this is exactly the same target as this one right here that Jenny's holding. So we'll get into how to use that a little in a little more detail in just a minute. Back to Lightroom. So now I have color corrected all of the images. The last thing, once I get the lens corrections done, is if I were doing architecture, I would go in and tweak the uh, something called upright, which corrects for uh, aiming the camera up and its perspective correction, but that's for another thing and not really apropos to, uh, to color. The last thing I want to talk about is color calibration. Now, Adobe's done a good job on camera raw. And if you want to have your camera look like itself, I like to use camera faithful. It's just a little more accurate for my Canon cameras. Nikon, it has a different name. All everyone has a different name, but take a look at what the one is most accurate and decide which one you like better. So there's the standard, a little warmer, and there's the faithful, a little cooler and a little tiny bit brighter. So those are the one, those are the things that I do pretty much for everything. Here's what's nice. All of my work is done. Everything here is color calibrated, it's color corrected, the exposure's been tweaked, the sharpenings have been set. I'm done. I can move on to something else. So if I tap the G key. All of the pictures all the way down until we get to the very bottom where I've got some product photographs. And since I, I did all of these, I'm going to deselect. That's the makeup artist standing behind Amy, by the way. Makeup artists are very important. So I'll click on the first one. Shift click on the last one. Tap the D key to go into develop. And it'll take a second. Uh, my Lightroom catalog runs a little bit slow because I'm running uh, 750,000 photographs right now and I haven't broken out a really big job. So if it's a little slow, I apologize in advance. Well, while that's going on, do we have any other questions, Sandra? Yeah, I was going to say this is a good opportunity. Um, Sheila is asking about the life 
time longevity of the color checker passport? How frequently does a photographer have to replace them? How long do they last? Well, the real cool thing about the color checker passport is it comes in a carrying case that folds up. So it's always covered. These are just charts and we'd shoot them and then we'd set them down and they'd get dust on them. And my original color checker chart, which is the original version, uh, is gosh, it's almost 40 years old and it's scarred and dented and dinged. And I really don't trust it anymore, but I keep it around because it's a, it's been around a long, long time and I wouldn't want to get rid of it. So as long as the uh, patches are clean and you notice that Jenny here is grabbing it with her fingertips. I work really hard to have people not do that. Notice everybody else is pretty much holding it by the edges and that's to keep the uh, patches clean. I, these are the original color checker passports. When did those come out, Sandra? Do you remember? The original color checker passports? Yeah. They are almost seven years old. These I should my... point out, too, though. Go ahead. The, the, the original color checker is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. So it's, it's 40 years since the original color checker target. This um, right hit the market and it's still considered uh, the industry standard for professionals today. Right. Uh, so my original ones are working just fine. These are seven years old and uh, I have had no trouble or issues with them. This color checker chart, a little, a quick little story because we've got time for it. I saw Greg Gorman, who is also a Colorado for x Right, at a, uh, I think it was a PMA show or photo plus. I'm not sure in Las Vegas, it was PMA because PPE, PPE is always in New York. And he had this three patch chart. So I went to my camera store to get one and they say they don't make them. So I called x Right and said, what's the deal? I'm writing a book and I really want to feature this because it's the greatest thing since sliced bread until they came up with a color checker passport, of course. And so they actually made me one. And I've, so I've got one of the original beta editions, and that's what you're seeing here. If you could hold it, you could actually run your finger over it and see where they'd pasted the, uh, the Great Tag Macbeth at the time logo on it. So it's a very interesting color management and how reactive um, they are to the photographers. And as a side note, uh, they're also involved with Pantone, who selects the colors of the year. So x Rite is hugely involved in color not only for photographers, but if you've ever had a paint sample matched at Home Depot or Lowe's, that's also x Rite technology. They're really, really terrific, and they're, they're great people. I'm really honored to be part of their team. So the passports will last really a long time, I, unless you drop one in the water or something like that. They're, and the reason they're so expensive, they're about 90 bucks. They're all handmade. They're all put together by hand, so it's really quite a great deal. So here's, the, I'm going to just reset these and make sure that everything's back to zero. Command or control one, by the way, is a keyboard shortcut for the basic tab. And I'll just click reset and all of them reset. And you can see all of a sudden it just got really dull. Well, rather than go through the whole exposure thing, I'm just going to go to this one and look here. My exposure is really close. So tap the W key, neutralize. Go to detail, click into about 100%, go to lens corrections. And if you're in, if you're in Lightroom, you can make a preset for all of this. Remove chromatic aberrations. Sometimes you want to check to make sure it picks the right lens. I've had occasional failures where it picks an icon lens instead of the Sigma that I tend to use. And uh, then camera faithful, and all of those are done. It's just a matter of the art director selecting the image she wants, and I take care of doing minor retouching, and we're done. So that's pretty much the workflow. And if there are there any questions now, Sandra, at all? Yes, I do. I have a question from Joy. Joy wants to know, is there a rule for how to photograph the color checker, particularly when you're not in a studio? So, for example, at a wedding, um, you know, during the ceremony. Uh, is it just holding the target towards the camera in position that you want to take the photo? Or is there more involved in it? Joy, I love you. It's a perfect question. And I'll, I happen to actually have an example of that. 
And no, you don't aim it back at the uh, camera. You have to aim it towards the main source of illumination. And I'll give you an example. Let's go over and let me uh, open some things in Camera Raw. So it'll just take a second. So this is Camera Raw. And notice the lighting here on AJ. It's when it's okay, it's not window light, it's in the studio, but I faked window light with a soft box. And she's underexposed. So the rule is you aim the color checker at the light source. So if the color checker were sitting here aimed directly at the camera, it would be way underexposed. So I'm looking at this patch right here. So when you're at a wedding or anything like that, you aim it at the source of light. Now, if the sun is behind the subject, the source of light is the open sky, not the backlight. So it's really important to understand where the, where the main light that you're exposing for is coming from. If you're using an incident light meter, the one with a little white dome, if you aim that at the source of light, you hold the color checker passport exactly the same way as you would the incident light meter. So let's go through this process on camera raw since we've done it in Lightroom. And the reason I like working in Camera Raw more than I do in Lightroom is because I've got color samplers. That's this little guy right here. And the keyboard shortcut is S, so I can click right here. And there are my highlights. Oh, I nailed my exposure. Now let's be honest here. Let's go back to this one. I didn't get it right exactly the first time. Or, so here, 228, 229, 229, it's underexposed. So I know that I need more light. And the way I find that is I just go to the exposure slider and drag it over. And for some reason, um, it, the redraw on this is just crazy. But if I drag this up until I get to 242, I need another half a stop of exposure. By the way, if you double click, any of the controls in either Lightroom or in Camera Raw, they'll go back to the original setting. So if you want to go between them, you click and then double click to go back. So you've got a preview of it, every individual setting. So let me refresh this. I'm just going to click Escape and open them up again. So let's take a look at these last three images. and I'll just shift click, which is exactly the same thing as auto sync. So with the sampler tool checked, I'll put the first sampler on white, the second sampler on black, because again, I don't want to go under that 25 slash 7% uh, threshold. And here you can see I'm in the 40s. That's a very happy place. I don't care just so long as it's well above 25. And then the last one I'll put on the patch I'm going to neutralize. So if we look at number three, we can see that as shot was really close to neutral, but I'm still going to color balance those images with the color balance tool, which is the same thing in Lightroom as the white balance tool. And this keyboard shortcut is I for eyedropper. So if I click on that, the numbers neutralize, they're almost identical. And to give you an idea, there are 256 steps in Photoshop, so a 2.56 deviation is 1%. So a one-point deviation is less than 1%, and nothing in uh, known photography will ever uh, cause that to be a problem. There we go. I'm just reuse doing that to refresh. So now, the workflow is identical. I'm going to hold down the Option key, Click on the whites, roll it over until I see that pop in. There it is. I'm going to back it up and look at the numbers, 254, 254, 254, which is equivalent to those high 99s in Lightroom. On the blacks, isn't it interesting? You'd swear that that background is black, but it's not. I have to drag the 
drag it down quite a bit to get to black. But I'm going to look, and you can see right up in AJ's hair, that there's some black areas in there. So, you know, again, I'm going to be really conservative here and not put too much black in. But if I run the cursor over this, you can see that 12, 11, and 11 in the background, it's going to reproduce as black when I print it. So that's setting everything up for color and exposure using the color checker. Again, in the detail uh, for sharpening, I'm just going to go up to 100% because I know that's where I want it. I've done my tests. Lens corrections. Profile. And we've got that set up, so we're... There we go. And this is the Sigma 120 to 300 F28. And for color, remove color aber uh, chromatic aberration. And all of my work is done except for going and choosing camera faithful. And you can see the difference. So there's the workflow in camera raw and answering the question about how do you actually point the color checker. Joy, I'm eternally grateful for that question. That was a great lead into this segment. Thank you. Do we have any other questions, Sandra? Uh, yes. Elizabeth Luther asks, with all of these things in post, do you set up uh, an in-camera custom profile as well? Uh, no, I don't. Um, and I, I, have, I have a friend of mine who's also a Colorado, Jim DeVitale, and he's a big believer in it. Um, He's, he's a much more involved product photographer than I am, so he's much more uh, concerned about color. But he uses the uh, X-Rite software to create his camera calibrations, and uh, he's adamant about it. And this is a matter of style. I find this works really well for everything that I've done, and all my clients are happy. However, you are certainly welcome to do it. It's very, very easy to do, and it will work with the passport or the original color checker target or they even make a business card size color checker target which i happen to have one it's a prized possession um, and i use that for really macro work so i hope that answers that question any others sandra uh yes let's see here um Armando Lopez asks how would i use the color checker in nature and outdoors Great question. I carry mine, and, and the new ones, unfortunately, don't come with this lanyard. And Sandra, you got to tell product management to get the lanyards back because I just yes. I just hang it around. The what? I'm yeah, sorry? The, the lanyards are being uh, added back into the product. Awesome. But I just put it around my neck, and when uh, I'm in nature, I just hold it out at arm's length, take a picture of it, now, if I'm doing a landscape shot, you know, on the tripod and that, I'll have, if I'm by myself, I'll just put the self-timer on and go stand in front of the camera and take the picture just so I have it. Now, here's the thing. I want it for exposure in that case, because usually, let's say you're in a forest and there's a lot of green and there's backlight coming in. Do you really want to take everything to neutral and get rid of the ambient color that's there you might want to to see what it looks like but i'm guessing i'm guessing you're going to want to leave that natural color the way it is again the passport will help tremendously when it comes to setting exposure and making sure you've got details in the shadows uh any other questions at this point sandra yes we have one more question from terry dunbar and he says i just started shooting infrared with a converted camera Will the color checker passport work for infrared shooting landscapes? I don't know because I haven't played with it and I absolutely, you know, I, I, I will work to find out. I don't know the answer to that. I would guess it would, but that would be purely a guess. So I don't know, but great question. That's one to look up. Thank you. Is that all the questions? We got them all cleared. One more question from Glenn Hewitt. Um, Glenn wanted to know, how did you get the color sampler? Oh, good, good question. Let's go back and look at that again. Let me open these up in Photoshop again. The color sampler is right here in Camera Raw. And let me zoom in so you can see it. 
We'll just move over here a little bit. So this is the color sampler tool. The keyboard shortcut is S. There is no color sampler in Lightroom, and I've been, I've been yelling at them, begging them on bended knee for eight years to put one in and no such luck yet. But we got soft proofing because they said they'd never, ever give us zero to 255 in Lightroom, but it's there now. So I, I'm holding out hope. Any other, Sandra? Uh, Keith wanted to know, do you know what the Nikon equivalent to camera faithful is? I don't, but it's really easy to find out. All you do is to go, well, wait a minute. I don't think I have any NEFs on this computer. You just, you go into either Lightroom and I'm going to show you something in Lightroom just to see if, see if we can find a Nikon camera and I'll show you. If I click on all photographs and then come up to metadata, and this may take a moment or two because again, it's going through uh, three quarters of a million images, but it will actually tell me every single camera that I've got based on the EXIF metadata. And if I can find an icon, I'll show you. Do we have another question in the interim? One question from Harold was, what's the number that you want that white patch to read? You want for exposure. There we go. Here we've got some Nikon pictures. For exposure, you want... Um, 242 to 245 as highlight with details. You could go as far as 248 if you wanted to. When you use the white clipping, you want it to read 254. In Lightroom numbers, that would be 95.1 to about 95.5. And then when you adjust the white clipping, it'll go up to 99.5, 99.6-ish. Okay, so here's Reed Hoffman of Blue Pixel. He teaches the Nikon school, as a matter of fact. So we'll just pick on this color checker chart. And as you can see, I actually use it all the time. So let's just tap the D key. And the question was, what is, and let's change this over to the current version. And it is called, okay, it looks like they label it by the camera, or it would be camera neutral, I believe, is the one you want for Nikon. So that's the answer there. But this is where you find it. It's under the calibration tab. And in camera raw, let's just pop back and open up just one file. In camera raw, it's the camera calibration. It's this icon right here. And under um, camera standards, so it would be under camera profile. This is also where if you're using the color checker um, software, this is where that profile would appear. You can actually load them in. And if you load them into one, it appears in the other because it's the same engine. Okay, any others? Philip Edelsberg wants to know, he said, I have an old Macbeth color checker target. Me too. Which gray square is the middle gray? Neutral 8, 6.5, 5, or 3.5? You know, I don't know offhand. Do you know, Sandra? I and do there, and by, by middle gray, it's going to be one of these two right here. Let me just zoom in so you can see this. It's going to be one of these two. And it doesn't really matter. And if we open this up in, fo well, it's open in Photoshop. Let, let's just see if we can, whoops. Let's just see if we can, uh, Let's see, where's my info panel? Hang on a second. Here we go, info panel. So if I hover over this one, 174, it's this one right here. Because you can see it's very, very close to 127. So that would be the neutral right there. That would be the middle gray. Okay, and then the final question here is from Juan, and uh, they want to know, is mini color checker used the same way as the passport checker or the classic target? They're all used identically the same way. Uh, there's, there's no difference. And the, the 24 patch here is identical to this 24 patch. Uh, and, and these, by the way, the, the classic target is still available, as is the mini. I just use the passport because it's so easy to carry. And inside it's got a white 
uh, white balance. If you want to use just a white patch, you need that for something. So they're, they're really terrific and they fit in your back pocket. There's smaller than a cell phone. So there's no reason not to have them everywhere. And it's fun. You can probably see that people do make lots of faces when you, uh, uh, when they're holding the charts like Victoria here or Jeff down in the corner, uh, they have a lot of fun with them. Trish, uh, Trish Polio, she wants to know, in Lightroom, do you get the RGB numbers to appear under the, or how, rather, how do you get the RGB numbers to appear under the histogram? You just mouse over the patch. You can see it right here. Now, if you're in the library module, it gives you data about the camera. So you have to tap the D key to go into the develop module to get the numbers. Okay, so we've got about four minutes left. I want to run a really quick workflow exercise for you just as a review to show you how fast you can get through all of this stuff. And I have a collection that I've built down here of... Here we go. 233 pictures. This is Vanessa, and uh, she's a model I love working with. And so we've got three different poses, three different color checkers. And I want to show you how easy it is to move from color checker to color checker. So they're kind of my bookmarks. I'll click the first one, and let's just make these a little bit smaller. Then shift-click the last one, tap the D key, Tap the W key, neutralize the color, check the exposure, go to the white, hold down the option or the alt key, drag that up, back it off, go to detail, 100%. Like I say, you can write a, a preset for this part. Lens corrections, click, click. Correct lens, yep. And finally, camera calibration, camera faithful. Tap the G key to go back to the grid mode. Find the next color checker chart. Click on it. Go down to the next color checker chart and the picture before it. Hold down the shift key and click. Tap the D key. W key. Color balance, check the exposure. Okay, it's a little bit hot, so I might roll that back. And to do that, I'm going to use the, oops, let's go back to that. Sorry, hit the wrong button. That never happens to anybody here but me. So I'm using the uh, greater than or less than. So the exposure keys, I'll tap minus on the keyboard to bring that down. So there, that is the correct exposure. Then I'll go to the whites, hold down the option, bring that up, back it off, go to the blacks, and that looks good. I'll use that black area on our, on our uh, slacks, detail. 100%, lens corrections, enable, chromatic aberration, and finally, color calibration uh, will go to camera faithful. And you get the idea. I could go ahead and do the ones where she's dressed in the pink tutu, but I don't see any, any need to repeat it a third time. So that's pretty much everything I've got for you today on how to use the Color Checker Passport as really it's my secret weapon. If my light meter fails, I can always use the Color Checker Passport in my computer to set an exposure. I always know I get perfect color, and it's because of this great tool from X-Rite. So I'd like to share my contact information with you. 
You can find me at kevinamesphotography.com. If you need to get a hold of me, you can click on contact and send me an email or give me a phone call. Uh, I'm also an author at photofocus.com. You can see all of my articles at this link, www.photofocus.com slash author slash Kevin Ames. Do check out photofocus.com. There are a bunch of authors, including Joe McNally, who write regularly about photography, and it's a great place to get information, whether you're a beginner, an advanced amateur, or a pro. Sandra? Kevin, thank you for an awesome presentation today. We really appreciate all your expertise and information. There's lots of uh, lots of very nice uh, feedback from our attendees today that I will share with you. Also, uh, just a reminder to everyone who registered and participated in today's presentation, we will send out a link via email within the next 24 hours to the recording of today's broadcast. So you can view it back at your own leisure um, and, uh, and go back over the information that Kevin has so kindly provided for us today. Uh, one more thing, at the end of today's presentation, there will be a pop-up screen if you want to participate in a very brief four-question survey. At the end of that, uh, we will um, randomly choose uh, a winner to receive an iWin Display Pro monitor calibrator and a color checker passport. So um, please consider participating in our brief survey at the end of this presentation. That's it, folks. Thank you again. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. And please be sure to uh, let us know what other content and subjects you would like X-Rite to address in future webinars. Thanks again, folks. Bye-bye.